There's a passage in T.S. Eliot where he raises an important question. Suppose you have a feeling of deep spiritual contentment, a sense of oneness and connectedness. To what extent is that feeling meaningful? Or can it simply be explained by the fact that you had a nice dinner and you feel rested, physically satisfied? This is an important question for people who want to read deep meanings into their feelings. They want to feel that their feelings are real. That's what they really are and are very concerned about what they really feel. Because feelings can lie. They may indicate simply that your digestion is good and physically you're well provided for. So one way of avoiding that question is not to look at what the feelings really mean, but to look at what you can do with them. This is the Buddha's approach. As he points out, our feelings are fabricated. Even the happiness of nirvana, he said, is not a feeling. Every other happiness, though, is a feeling, and every feeling is fabricated. He says each of our feelings is something we put together for a certain purpose. We want a particular feeling, if nothing else, to establish who we are, what we want. There is a purpose, many times unknown, behind our feelings. So what do you do with the fact that feelings are fabricated? You learn how to fabricate them well. And even if you come up with uncomfortable feelings, there are uses for them. There's a study made years back of different facial expressions, how across cultures people express grief or contempt or happiness or ridicule. The whole range of human emotions are expressed by certain patterns of the muscles in your face. And the researchers who were working on this wanted to master all the different expressions. And one day they were working on the expression for sadness. And after trying to get all the muscles in the face together in an expression of sadness, they found at the end of the day they were sad. So again, this shows that the emotion doesn't necessarily have to be real, just because it's strong or pervasive. It may simply be a habit the way you carry your body, the way you express your face. So learn to make use of that fact. Instead of trying to dig down and see what your real feelings are, notice if you can create comfortable feelings in the body, good feelings, happy feelings. The way you hold your face, the way you hold your body, the way you breathe. This can give rise to good feelings, comfortable feelings, feelings of pleasure, rapture, as the Buddha said, pervading the body. And admittedly they are fabricated, but they have their uses. If you can maintain this kind of feeling, the mind is in a much better position to look at things from a calm and steady point of view. So when you run across a good feeling like this, if it just happens, or if you find that you can induce it, learn how to maintain the feeling. This is part of the duty of the, the path, is learning how to develop the path, the ease and well-being, even the sense of rapture that can come from the way you breathe, from the way you focus on the different elements in the body. Even uncomfortable feelings can have their purpose. 
the Buddha has an analysis of the different emotions that arise, in, both in people who are not on the path and in people who are. Take, for instance, what he calls householder grief, the grief of someone who's simply upset because they didn't get to see the sights or hear the sounds or smell the smells or taste the tastes, feel the tactile sensations or think about the ideas that they wanted to. They're disappointed in their aims. Now, most of us, our way of overcoming that particular kind of grief is to go out and try to find those sights and sounds, make them happen. So we feel householder joy. But the problem with householder joy is that it sometimes comes and then you lose it and you get back into householder grief and it goes back and forth and it doesn't really go anywhere. It's like throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it falls on this end, sometimes it falls on that end. There's no real rhyme or reason to this and you never get out of the cycle. He says the best way to deal with householder grief is to substitute it with renunciate grief. The grief that comes from realizing that there is a deathless, but you haven't attained it yet. Because even though it may be an uncomfortable feeling, still it points to a way out. It acknowledges there is a deathless, there is an escape. That in and of itself is a kind of hope. It offers hope. And the next thing you do is you try to work in that direction. That's why it's a useful emotion. It's not that every kind of grief or every kind of discomfort is bad. I don't know how many times you hear people saying, don't have any big goals in the practice because then you'll get dissatisfied because you haven't reached your goal. So just stay content with what you've got. It's like shooting an arrow without pulling the, the bow back and getting the string taut. The arrow is never going to go anywhere. It just stays right where it is. There has to be a certain amount of tension in the practice, a certain sense that I don't have yet what I really want in life. I don't have a true happiness yet. The sense of sanguega of dismay with the way you're living your life, and the sense of urgency that you've got to find a way out. Maybe an unpleasant emotion, but you need it in order to spur yourself along the path, to do what needs to be done. The desire for to be more generous, to be more virtuous, to be better at your meditation is not a bad desire. That's chanda, one of the bases for success. And so then you take that desire and you work on it. You decide that this really is important. And so as you work on the path and you feel deprived of this or that physical comfort, you say, that's not important. The more important thing is that there's a deathless and I haven't found it yet. Because ultimately, renunciate grief yields renunciate joy. Now, as you use it to spur yourself on to actually gain more concentration, to develop more discernment. So it's a feeling that has a purpose, a feeling that has a use. And you can induce it. It doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean it's not your authentic self. Because after all, when you dig around, you probably know everybody who comes here has heard the Buddhist teachings on trying to find an authentic self in form and feeling and all the other aggregates. You're not going to find it. But you can find things that you can use. After all, you take those aggregates and you turn them into the path. And one way of doing it is, even though you may feel renunciant grief, you're not just going to sit around and renunciant grief. You work in a way to find renunciant joy. You've got the breath. You've got all the elements in the body. How can you relate to them in a way that feels good? 
It gives you a sense of well-being in the present moment that doesn't have to depend on conditions outside. I mean, you could sit here and think about all the reasons that would make you miserable being here. It's hot outside. You don't have the comforts that you might have if you're living at home. All the long lists of grievances we might have. But what does that accomplish? It doesn't go anywhere at all. But you can also focus on the fact that you've got a breath. You've got the different elements in the body, the sense of liquid. You can focus on how sticky and disgusting the liquid is, or for the time being you can focus on the fact that liquid feelings in the body are cool. Use them to focus on, so you're not focusing on the heat. You can focus on the breath. What way is the breath? Light, totally unstuck, totally unfettered. It has nothing to do with heat or coolness at all. It's simply motion. The mind tunes into that kind of sensation. When you find you can start smiling, and then the smile on your face induces all the chemical reactions in the body that go along with smiling. You start feeling better. So try to induce the feelings that are helpful. And focus not on the issue of whether they're real or not, but focus on the fact that you've got them. What are you going to do with them? What use can you get out of them? What's the wisest thing to do with those feelings? the most helpful. And that way, instead of the fact that feelings are fabricated and thus questionable, you focus on the fact you you can fabricate them with discernment, with knowledge. As the Buddha points out, these feelings are fabrications that are often based on ignorance, which leads to suffering. But you can also fabricate them with knowledge that leads to the end of suffering. To look at where you are in the path. Sometimes it requires focusing on the grief, focusing on the discomfort. There's that passage in the what's called transcendent dependent core rising. We take all the factors that lead up to suffering, and then from suffering you develop conviction, and through conviction you develop the path, and from developing the path then you develop joy. This is his analysis of how you go from householder grief, the fact that you're not getting what you want, in through renunciant grief. You realize that there is a goal out there, there must be a way out. You haven't found it yet, and there's a certain amount of grief around that, but you can work with that until it develops renunciant joy. And then you can use that renunciant joy to get further along the path. So these feelings have their uses. Focus on their uses, and you get the most out of them.